Uh, our meeting is a uh, half hour later than, than normal, but uh, we had other commitments. So we had to, to, to back up the day. So I'd like to call the meeting to order. There's an agenda. Anybody have anything to add or, or, or delete from the agenda? And if not, okay, go ahead, uh, uh, Councillor Dantramal. Um, I, I can either add this on the agenda or just as part of the, my councillor's uh, report, but it would be, uh, I guess, snow removal uh, on the Rock Road in Lower West Pubnico. Okay, so do you want to add it or do you want to, to do it with your report? It, it doesn't like, really it doesn't matter. matter, right? Yeah, yeah, I'll do it in my report. I just okay. kind of want to okay. put it out there. So we need an approval of the agenda. Moved by Councillor Albright, seconded by Councillor Bork. All in favor signify by raising your hand. Contraminded, carried. Anybody have any conflict of interest uh, to declare? And even if you do, you can do it while when we when we get there. If you don't want to do it now, or if you don't know, but anyway, if if you have anything, you can declare it now, or wait till we reach it. Hearing none. Tonight we have a presentation. We have Dave, uh, Jamie Stephen. Tell it he. Torchlight bio resource. So I guess whenever you're ready, we're ready for your presentation. So take it away. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you to the uh, the council for the opportunity to present today. Is everybody seeing that all right? Yes. Yeah, excellent. So um, I've got a few slides, so I'll, I'll go through them quickly. But uh, what I'm here to, to talk about today is a potential demonstration project in Argyle, um, showcasing the potential of wood, of wood pellets as a fuel for central heating. So obviously everybody's aware of wood pellets as a fuel for uh, pellet stoves, etc. But this is really utilizing wood pellets, which you see there, as the primary fuel for central heating. So whether that's forced air or um, or with uh, radiators or in-floor heating. So this is really a proven approach for reducing energy uh, poverty and increasing community resilience, largely because you're utilizing a local fuel. So what is uh, modern bioheat, modern wood heating? So what you see here is a range of different approaches. On the top left is a, is a wood pellet boiler that heats a home. Um, this is a central appliance, so basically uh, you could, it's thermostat controlled. You can control it with your cell phone when you're about to arrive home and you want to turn up the heat. Everything is fully automated. Um, you're, as, as, a, as a homeowner, you don't need to touch it more than once every three weeks or so, uh, where you empty the ash bin into the, into the garden. On the right is a commercial uh, installation. So this is actually at a, at a, uh, a college in the United States. And this is uh, three commercial institutional pellet boilers um, that are heating that, that college and producing hot water, which is circulated to all the buildings. On the lower left is kind of at the extreme end of the spectrum. And this is a plant in downtown Stockholm. It's, uh, it's heated 100% with wood chips um, and it heats 190,000 residences uh, from this one plant using underground hot water pipes. So why do wood pellets make sense for, for Argyle? Well, let's look at the baseline of what's going on now. All the energy expenditures on oil and electricity leave the region. Um, and certainly most of, most of those expenditures also leave the province. Um, the existing op these op existing options are also high carbon. That's also true for electricity. I know that Argyle has been a leader in, in wind energy, but overall that's still a relatively small contributor to the grid and the majority is still coal and, and, and gas. Um, wood pellets are, are Nova Scotia produced fuel and, and Renee is here from, from Shaw Resources that is a producer of that fuel. And so it's made locally and some of the wood um, from coming from Argyle is eventually makes it to wood pellet plants in, in the province. It's also proven. Uh, so there's 1 million residential wood pellet boilers in the, in the European Union. Um, and, it, and the reason this is such highly prevalent is because when it comes to the the, the, the total all-in cost 
of heat over 20, 25 years, which is the life of the boiler, it is typically the lowest cost renewable, clean, low carbon heat supply. It's also the most efficient use of wood when it comes to greenhouse gas reductions. You're talking about kind of 90% efficiency. Um, and because you're utilizing a local resource, the energy price is predictable. So it's not subject to global pricing in terms of heating oil, et cetera. And fundamentally, when we talk about forestry, we need a market for um, low grade wood fiber and, and mill residues in order for the, that forestry to be sustainable. So what you see on the left here is a residential pellet boiler and on the right commercial boiler. These are all automatically fed um, and, and these are you know, pretty high tech appliances. Um, what the kind of setup at a home looks like. So on, on the left there you see is, is a bulk delivery truck. So similar to heating oil. Essentially, this truck comes once, maybe twice a year and blows pellets into a storage uh, area. Um, then those are automatically fed to the pellet boiler. Um, a key thing here is it, when it comes to utilizing a solid fuel of which, you know, pellet boiler or pellets are, are solid fuel is having a buffer storage tank. So this is essentially a hot water tank that stores energy and allows the, the boiler um, to operate for an extended period of time and then to shut off for a long period of time and then distribute that water, that heat uh, to domestic hot water or space heating, whether that's forced air, um, radiators, in-floor heating, et cetera. So these are some examples of pellet delivery trucks. Um, on, on the left, the lower left, you see a kind of commercial delivery and then some of the smaller ones. Lower right is really kind of the simplest form, which is a, a you know, bulk trailer pulled by a pickup truck. Um, there's different storage options for, for residences. Um, these are some of the inside ones. So I mentioned the, the you know, kind of um, having a pellet storage room um, that can be with slanted slot sides or with uh, suction. Um, but it could also include an alternative is to kind of have uh, on the upper left there, which is, is a kind of fabric um, storage uh, container, which can be put in kind of any basement or garage or, or what have you. In terms of the in-building heat distribution, so we, you know, the key here is obviously to keep the existing uh, heat distribution um, central heating system within the building. So that could be radiators, this is that in floor. Um, there could be a hydronic air handler. So basically just like air conditioning, um, you, you know, you blow air past a, a coil. In the case of air conditioning, it's cold. In the case of, uh, in the case of a wood pellet boiler and hot water, it's, it's, it's obviously hot. And then there's also kind of, a, kind of a fan coil similar setup to what, what you have with say a mini split with the heat pump. Um, obviously when we're talking about uh, wood heating, everybody is, is typically concerned about the, the particulate matter. So what I can say about wood heating is just like many things in life, you can do it very well or you can do it very poorly. And this is a log graph to give you kind of an idea of the extreme differences in terms of particulate matter, depending upon how you're actually burning the wood. And what you can see here is that um, a, a conventional wood stove produces the same particulate matter as about 150 modern wood pellet boilers. So it's really, uh, you know, completely different um, type of approach to utilizing wood as, as a fuel. So one of the things I mentioned is it's proven. So despite what we hear, and I know that Argyle has been, uh, as I say, a leader in, in wind energy, um, when you look at the EU, European Union, which is leading decarbonization efforts in, in, around the world, the amount of energy supplied by solid biomass heating, of which wood pellets is a big part, is actual, actually equal to all renewable electricity generation combined. That includes large hydropower, onshore wind, offshore wind, solar, etc. So it really is the proven approach for decarbonization. Uh, bioenergy is, as a whole actually is, is, is uh, equal to 60% of the renewable energy in the EU. So really is the proven approach uh, for decarbonization and is contributing to the largest amount of greenhouse gas reductions. Um, as I mentioned, in terms of boilers, uh, this is a proven technology. None of this, this is all uh, off the shelf stuff. The largest manufacturer in Europe produces over 35,000 boilers per year. So we're not talking about some experimental technology or anything along those lines. Um, when it comes to, to Nova Scotian decarbonization, direct emissions from buildings are about 13% of the, 13 of the emissions. Uh, and this is largely like heating oil, natural gas, et cetera. But when you look at the contribution of the electricity consumed uh, for, for space heating and hot water, building heating, heating buildings is actually 40% of the greenhouse gas emissions in, in Nova Scotia. 
And now why is this important? So you may have heard um, pr uh, Prime Minister Trudeau announce um, prior to Christmas a plan to increase the price of carbon to $170 a tonne CO2 by 2030. So what this means in terms of the, the cost of fuels is quite dramatic. So if, if that's actually applied fully to heating oil, what you're talking about is equivalent of 45 cents per liter on top of what you're already paying for heating oil now. In addition, there's another policy that's being implemented next year called the Clean Fuel Standard. This, this heating oil is also subject to this policy and it's projected that this will be an additional 15 cents per liter by 2030. So you're talking an additional 60 cents per liter for heating oil beyond what you're already paying and then obviously uh, making adjustments for inflation. So what the baseline is now is not what the baseline will be in 2030. This gives a comparison of some of the other um, heating options as well. And what we can see is that over that, because wood pellets are a low carbon fuel, um, they, are, they are going to be increasingly lower cost as a fuel compared to the alternatives. When we look at the all-in delivered cost of, of heat, so this is, this is the fuel, capital, operating, et cetera, what you can see is that, and we see heating oil on the left, is that baseboards are, are, are the most expensive. Um, and wood pellets are certainly, uh, without any type of subsidies, quite competitive with, with air source heat pumps, um, depending upon the building. Um, but they're, fundamentally, the fuel is going to be lower cost for wood pellets, but there is a high capital cost associated with, with boiler installation because it is quite a high tech unit. So how do we make the economics work? So um, it is the lowest cost fuel. So for homeowners, for building owners, um, that's really what matters on an, on an annual basis, right? But there is that high upfront capital cost. And I know that Argyle is very familiar with the Investing in Canada infrastructure program and finding unique ways to apply funding from this program to your you know, quite rural municipality. Um, and that's, that's prevalent with your um, septic system program where I think you're gonna have over 90 homes um, utilizing infrastructure dollars from the province and the federal government to be able to deliver what you might wanna call distributed infrastructure. And this is kind of what we're doing here, you know, proposing here with the wood pellet boilers. Um, so th there, there's certainly an opportunity to, to take a similar type of approach. And because it's also a revenue generating activity, namely, you know, supplying heat, there's some opportunities as well to use different types of matching funding beyond what, you know, you're doing with the, the septic systems. Um, what we're proposing for the demonstration project is when Northern Pulp shut down, uh, the provincial government created a fund called the uh, Nova Scotia Forestry Innovation Transition Trust. So this is about $50 million. Um, it's really to get to find a new way to, to do forestry um, and to kind of reinvent the forest sector in Nova Scotia. And so what you know, you may have heard of, um, of the uh, procurement um, in terms of the provincial government with, with uh, some of the provincial government owned buildings in Bioheat. So we're trying to apply that same type of principle with a demonstration project, but at the residential scale. Um, so what we're what we're proposing is is that is to do a demonstration project. Um, there is, you know, we're certainly not asking for any type of uh, contribution in terms of cash from the municipality. Um, we're seeking you know, 100 of the costs of doing the on, on the terms of the cash costs um, from this fund. Um, proposed right now is that Shaw Resources, and as I mentioned, Renee is on the line, uh, would, would be the supplier of, of the wood pellets and deliver them in large truck um, to a silo owned by the municipality. These boilers would be owned by the municipality, but in, in people's residential buildings. So similar to your, similar to your um, septic system uh, arrangement. Um, I've obviously discussed this extensively with, with Hans, and so um, the idea is that, that we, Torchlight, would prepare the application. Um, it would be submitted by the municipality. Uh, and, uh, and then, um, you know, we hope for the best in, in terms of uh, securing that, uh, that funding for the demo project with the idea that longer term, showing that this, this approach works, that it could be applied to m many, many more buildings, not only in Argyle, but across the province. Uh, this is just an example of what the pellet silo pilot pellet hub within Argyle could look like, whereby there's bulk delivery being delivered there, and then local delivery utilizing 
a uh, an existing local fuel delivery company um, to to supply pellets to uh, homeowners that would be interested in uh, essentially receiving a free boiler. So thank you for your, your time. I know I ran a bit over, um, but uh, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, you may have. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? I can't see everybody, so there. Calvin, did you have? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I, I guess just to uh, try to straighten up in my own head here. So you're, you're in Argyle, you're looking for residential uh, installations. Is that what you're looking for? Or for, for also small businesses or just so I'm clear? Yeah, so I mean, we would largely, largely target residential, but working with the municipality, with the CAO and, 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 and with HENS, we could potentially say, okay, well, we want to do five commercial buildings. There tends to be more consistency in terms of the, the scale of residential buildings. Obviously, there's a big range in, in commercial buildings, um, but we could certainly, uh, you know, if there are specific commercial or institutional or municipal buildings that you thought would be good candidates for this type of approach, then we could certainly include those within the proposal and, and adjust the proposal to reflect the fact that they would have a larger uh, pellet demand than say a residence. Okay, so by by residential building, you mean like an apartment building or? No, uh, like a single family, single, not, like a, a relatively large or old single family detached home. Um, so typically when you get to very, very small buildings and particularly new, very small buildings, um, it's pretty hard to justify some of the capital costs but as a building gets larger, as it gets less efficient, um, that's where pellets become much more cost competitive with, uh, with electric options. Okay, great, thanks. Anybody else? Councilor Boudreau. Uh, yeah, I got a question. Uh, I'm, I'm geared up at the moment with uh, a boiler, hot water heat. How difficult would it be to change from hot water to uh, wood pellet? So you're, you're still going to use hot water as your, as your distribution throughout the building. So really, it's um, there's no kind of, as I said, that, that there's about 35,000 units um, manufactured by the, the, the single largest manufacturer. So this is really off the shelf technology. It's basically take out your oil boiler or, or take out your oil boiler put in a wood pellet boiler. Um, you do, there is obviously a little bit, because the fuel is less uh, dense in terms of the bulk density, you need to figure out how you're gonna store that in your basement or in your garage. Um, and certainly you don't need bulk delivery. You could do that now uh, with, with bagged pellets. W what's been successful in Europe is the ability to have um, delivered you know, bulk delivery really Im increases the um the ease of ease of um, use if you will for homeowners because lugging 40 pound bags of pellets is not typically great for older in particular um residents but very simple change out and that's very standard in terms of you can utilize your existing and you know components within your home but you're simply changing the boiler just like you would for if you're replacing it with a new oil boiler yeah uh, one more question uh, like obviously when you're buying bulk pellets, it's going to be a lot cheaper than buying them from the, just like one bag at a time, I would imagine. So, so certainly as the supply chains get, get going, um, the, the price does come down. There's also obviously the benefit is you don't have to go to the store and, and go and pick it up. Um, there, there are, there are savings typically, as I say, the larger volume that moves, the, yeah. the more competitive the, the pricing can, can be. Yeah. Um, but there is there is absolutely that ease of convenience component as, as well. Yeah. yeah, sounds interesting. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Councilor Donaldson. Yeah, I don't have an opinion one way or another, but I've heard the argument when it comes to the carbon footprint that producing pellets and export them, especially to Europe has more of a negative effect than actually using the pellets. Uh, what's your stance on that argument? Um, so I, 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 interesting, I'm doing some work on this now, but um, I, so a lot of it is, 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 is a misunderstanding in terms of how that carbon is counted. 
So the way that we car count uh, forestry carbon is that as soon as the tree is cut down, we assume that it's been emitted, right? So there is no, uh, um, the people think that that carbon is not being counted somehow, that's simply not true. What I can say is that if you look at the EU as an example, um, bioenergy consumption or bioenergy consumption and, and obviously by, by, uh, by definite production has increased by over 150% since 1990. And at the same time, their forest cover uh, and the, the amount of carbon stored in their forests has increased by 43%. So you can also not, uh, most of the, the pellets in, in uh, Nova Scotia are produced from sawmill residues. You need to, like, you, you can't operate a sawmill uh, and produce lumber for homes, et cetera, without having that market for sawmill residuals. Um, so there is, there is absolutely a way to have sustainable forestry. And in actual fact, you need a market um, for this low grade wood fiber in order to have sustainable forestry. Because if you don't have that market, you're only removing the high quality saw logs. And that in turn means that you're decreasing the genetic quality of the forest. And so you may know the Leahy report, that's the, you know ecological forestry. It's absolutely essential to have this market for um, for low grade wood fiber. So I, I vehemently disagree with the statements that um, that that biomass is somehow higher carbon than coal or or anything along those lines. It's simply not true. Um, the other thing I would say is if you're comparing efficiencies, utilizing coal at, or utilizing uh, wood pellets at your own house is three times as efficient as the coal burning at uh, at a power plant or biomass burning at a power plant as well. So it is the proven approach to de decarbonize. And as I said, in, in Europe, they've over 200 million tons per year uh, of CO2 reductions. Um, to put that in perspective, Nova Scotia's total greenhouse gas emissions are 17 million tons. So it is really a, a proven approach. Thank you. Anybody else? What, what would be the uh, uh, ballpark figure for someone to install that in a home, just, just a normal home? Yeah, so and this, is, this is where having some type of program um, or, or, or the municipal involvement is critical. Uh, because if you look at the, 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 av the levelized cost of energy, that is the total cost of energy, over 20, 25 years. Uh, wood pellets are, are, are definitely uh, amongst the, the lowest, if not the lowest. Um, the challenge is that high upfront capital cost. So you're, you're talking kind of an unsubsidized installation cost of about $27,000. And so it is very, very high. And that's why um, it, you know, wood pellet boilers have not caught on in Canada like they have, have in, in Europe. Um, some of that is also the way that people view how long they're gonna be in their home. Right, um, and, and comfort with their investment in a wood pellet boiler is going to actually be, be um, repaid if they sell their home. In Europe, everybody is very confident that that investment will be repaid because it's well known. Um, it's a different thing, obviously, as we're starting this out in Canada. And so finding a way to address that high upfront capital cost, which then leads people to have a much lower uh, operating cost on an annual basis, is really why I'm, I'm here today, right? So. Okay. Anybody else? See, okay. Uh, CAL News. <clears throat> Thank you for the presentation, Jamie. Um, the pilot project, I may have missed this, this aspect of it. Um, so the first phase of a project of this nature would not necessarily include a municipal investment in in a pellet plant, uh, is is that is that a correct assumption, or or am I wrong there? Like, so I, I guess I, maybe the question I should be asking is, at what point does it make sense for the municipality to invest in a central location for for uh, for pellet collection and distribution? That's the first part of the question, and I'll I guess I'll save the second one for after. Yeah. So, and this is why why Shaw is, is on the line. So Shaw produces. There's different grades of wood pellets. So there's an industrial grade. Uh, and then there's a kind of a residential grade, which is higher because it has less ash, that type of thing. And so Shaw is the primary producer of residential grade wood pellets in the province. Um, they have a plant in uh, Um, And so they would be delivering bulk to the municipality. 
Um, they, that's a very large truck. And so that's not appropriate for residential delivery. So they would be delivering to a, a hub, if you will. And that was that last picture I showed you, essentially like a little silo. Uh, and they'd fill that up, uh, you know, a couple times a year or so. You know, it might, we'd have to work out the scale, but maybe like 50 tons, maybe 100 tons, that type of thing. Um, and then there would be local delivery uh, with, with utilizing one of the local delivery oil, likely, you know, heating oil delivery companies. So that we're ensuring that there's a kind of a transition there um, and a diversification of their business, right? So we're not we're not trying to um, eat away at their their business, right? Because they're in the they're in the fuel delivery business, not necessarily the, the heating oil business per se. Um, and so, in terms of when does it make sense to have a wood pellet production plant in the municipality or or in you know in, in, in the area? Um, there are pellet plants in the range of say like 10 to 15,000 tons. Um, and so a, a typical home might consume 10 tons. So it gives you kind of an idea of, of, of what's there. A school uh, might consume 200, 300 tons, that type of thing. A hospital might be in the range of, a, you know, may, maybe 1,000, 1,500. A big hospital might be a couple, you know, 2,000. So it gives you an idea of, of what scale you can kind of start at. Obviously, just like any industrial manufacturing, it tends to be that as you get bigger, you get more, um, it, you know, the, the actual production economics uh, improve. Um, but I will say that when it comes to bioenergy, there's also that that feedstocks, you know, that fuel supply limitation. And if you have to drive further and further out, it becomes more and more costly. So the demonstration by project by itself certainly doesn't justify building a new pellet plant. Um, but, you know, if, if you could get you know, uh, several hundred uh, and particularly commercial institutional installations in Western Nova Scotia, you could certainly start looking at whether production locally would make sense economically. Okay, I, I, I think, uh, thanks for that. I, I, I think I, I, it was more around the, the storage and I think you okay. had that, that, you know, you come from Shubenacadie, but it would, it would have to be, there would have to be a storage almost immediately on site. Uh, because of the nature of how it's just how it's um, delivered, I, I guess the just if I may, uh, Warden, just one other question is um, so it because it has because it so so then the delivery and the sale of that wood pellet would become the responsibility of the municipality. So the municipality might sub out the the delivery to oil or to other companies to do that. But ultimately, it would be the municipality that would take the wood pellets from the silo and distribute it to residents for a fee. Is that's the concept, correct? Well, it, or so essentially, there would be a, a municipal utility because you're owning the boilers, essentially, right? But in terms of management of that uh, that utility, that how you want to do that, whether you want some a staff member to do it or whether you want that management to be contracted out and, and simply overseen by a municipal uh, board, you know, by a, a utility board that could include uh, councillors and maybe some residents or that type of thing. That, you know, this is, this is uh, kind of the, the, you know, the proposed model whereby you own the assets, um, but really how you want to do that utility management is up to you. Right, and we, we can work through that as we put together that um, that proposal for the for the transition trust fund. Right. In, in discussions with Hans, I mean, he said one of the key things is that if it was managed by another entity, they want you know it would be preferable to have a single uh, point of contact, obviously, um, rather than you know. Shaw's doing this and then and then another company is doing the delivery and somebody else is doing the maintenance. So it's really about um, how, you know, structuring that and that, you know, we can certainly play a role in that. Um, but it really comes down to how does the municipality want to do the actual ongoing management. And so I'm happy to work with you on on coming up with the best approach that fits the, the goals of the municipality. Okay. Mm -hmm. One yes, am I? Can I? You just oh, I see her. okay. Um, so just and last one is uh, so you had mentioned that there's different types of wood pellets, 
and that there's a residential grade that Shaw does. Thank you very much, Shaw. Um, so there are some other, um, there's some other locations that are now picking up wood pellets as an option. So for instance, and I do see this on, on Facebook, that you know the, the Wedgeport School construction plan includes wood, wood pellets as a source of heat. So I'm presuming that that would be a different type of pelleting system for a school. So that, that's similar to those commercial um, boilers I showed you, um, the, like the one heating the US campus, that type of thing. Um, as the scale of the boiler increases, um, the lower the quality of pellet that can can be be delivered. Um, the one of the one of the key determinants of quality is ax content. Um, so if you have a lower quality pellet, you're going to have to empty the the ax more often. Um, there's also some other components in terms of stability and things like that. Um, but but overall, when you get to that, as you get to that kind of school or even um, or, or even uh, you know hospital scale, uh, you can certainly utilize a, a kind of lower lower grade pellet. but I mean you also um, you know you, you're not necessarily always wanting to move to what they use in the coal-fired power plants in Europe, for example, right as a replacement for coal. Yeah, you, we, you we can currently, on that, Renee. So. Well, we currently supply pellets to a few schools in Nova Scotia, Blue Nose Academy in Bridgewater. And uh, one of the things that uh, people want when, when they have pellet boilers is low maintenance. And the better the quality of the fuel, the lower the maintenance to the unit. And so the schools in Nova Scotia today burning pellets, they want a premium pellet. They've tried um, a lower grade pellet and um, the difference is just um, too much for them. So, so they, they prefer the higher grade and the lower maintenance, so. Which is the residential grade, correct? Which is the, the residential grade. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and, and I would say as well, like there's, um, there's some of these the projects you might have seen that there's some wood chip projects um, that, have, that have been, the provincial government is doing. And so there, there's a, um, oftentimes pellets are chosen because of their ease of use, as an example, right? There is for sure a role for, for which it, particularly as you get into larger and larger and larger projects, but pellets have a flowability that is not there with wood chips. They have a, uh, a uniformity that is not there with wood chips. And so that, and also their lower capex in terms of uh, capital cost in terms of the actual boiler installation. So there, there certainly are some um, ad advantages and, and if you have that, a lot of it's also the, the delivered cost is also related to the supply chain that is established. Um, whenever you're talking any type of solid fuel, having an established supply chain really helps in project development. So those are things. And, and, and we operate under a, a, a globally recognized fuel quality standard. So, um, you know, we meet a certain specifications, we're audited on an annual basis, we track this stuff on a daily basis. So it's, it's not just a random thing, this is a good pellet. It's an actual standard that, that, that uh, we meet and, and we're audited on, so. Okay, uh, Councillor Surratt. Uh, your lower grade of, uh, of pellet, uh, your BTU was, would be less, am I right? It's 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 not it's not significant typically. Um, I mean, there, if you have a higher ash content, then inherently you're going to have a lower energy content. Um, you know, it, there there is there is certain you know certainly some variation between pellets. I mean, there's variation between the parts of the tree, right? Uh, if you have if you have tension wood with more lignin in it, which kind of holds everything together, then it has a higher energy content than than some other parts of of the tree. Um, so for sure there, there, when it comes to the pellet standards, um, the energy content of the, the premium pellet, if you will, the, the residential grade pellet has to meet a higher standard than the other grades. But e even, a, even an industrial pellet, like what you're selling is you're selling energy. So yeah. when you're making industrial pellet that you're sending to Europe, you want it to be the, the better the quality, the more money you make. So the focus is always a high quality, even in that industrial, mm -hmm. industrial grade pellet. 
Yeah. You, you, you don't want to, number one, you don't want to be shipping ash and you don't want to be, and you don't want to be shipping any water. Obviously pellets are, are dried out already, but shipping in either of those two things is just lost money. So. Okay. I don't see any more questions. Um, you've got a little longer than our usual uh, <laughs> presentations, but it was very interesting. Um, so thank you very much for a very interesting uh, uh, and, and informative uh, presentation. Um, I know it's probably the, the, the way for the future, I'm not sure, but anyway, it's definitely getting more and more popular, I'm sure. So thank you very much again. Of course. When do we sign up? <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll so, so, um, so, Mr. Yeah. So, Go ahead. So uh, I just want to note to to Jamie that there are actually quite a few questions that are coming out of your presentation on our Facebook site. Okay. So I would invite you to, if you haven't already joined our Facebook site, Municipality of Argyle, um, feel free to do that. And uh, it, it might be useful to, for you to go and answer those questions directly uh, to some of the residents that are interested in your presentation. Um, obviously, if the questions relate to municipal business, we'll take care of those. Yeah. But technical questions around the nature of what, what you're proposing. Um, so I suspect out of this presentation, um, there'll be some work done uh, administratively to to understand you know exactly what this might look like which mm -hmm. which means that we're probably going to if, if council is interested in, in hearing more or understanding exactly as as uh, councillor Dontremo said uh, where do we sign uh, uh, you know to understand some of the dynamics of that before uh, before any sort of uh, heavy action is is completed in this area um, so I guess we'll look to you and your team to lead us through a process uh that you envision and and mm -hmm. if, if if we can line up something there yeah and so you know I, I, we we can prepare this this uh draft proposal uh for the fitt fund um it is you know would be your your submission um and but it, it, you know it's so working with you and with hans to to put that together um for for eventual submission i guess that's uh what i would um you know an indication from council that, that, that this is of interest so that I, if, I, if we put in the time to put together the proposal that there's a pretty good chance that the proposal would be submitted it's due at the end of april um so we could certainly have certainly have plenty of time to do that um but obviously we're we're um ho hopeful that that uh it is of interest and um certainly you know trying to recognizing the position of uh, that this is something new um, and that, you know, we're certainly not asking for any type of um, financial support or anything like that, but it, it does um, need some staff time uh, to put together that, you know, to understand where you're coming from and what, what priorities you have as a municipality. Okay. So I, I, will, I will have a look on Facebook and, uh, and, 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 and respond. Good enough. I'm okay. sure they'll appreciate that. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Yes. Thank you for your time. Yes. Okay. Next item uh, adoption of minutes. We have the Committee of the Whole, January 26. Need a motion to approve. Moved by Councillor Strett, seconded by Councillor Albright. All in favor, signify by raising your hand. Aren't you minded? Carrie. Special Council meeting minutes, February 1st, 2021. Moved by Council Albright, seconded by Councillor Donaldson, or you have a question? No? Okay. Uh, all in favor, signify by raising your hand. Aren't you minded? Carrie. Uh, Accessibility Advisory Committee minutes. Mover. Moved by Councillor Shret, seconded by Councillor Dotchamal. All in favor, signify by raising your hand. Contra minded, carried. And the uh, recreation uh, uh, minutes, need a mover. 
moved by Councillor Albright, seconded by Councillor Bork. All in favor, please raise your hand. Council, uh, carry Council, yeah. Uh, okay, we have business arising, and the first one is a sidewalk policy review. We were, this was given a task to uh, staff to, to look at this, to see what the policies were in other areas, and this is the report that, uh, that staff has uh, sent us, so maybe our CAO can uh, explain exactly and what he knows. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll keep this brief. Um, so the uh, I did a review of uh, local municipalities to see whether they had uh, policies or bylaws supporting sidewalk construction. And the best one that that I saw uh, happens to be our neighbor, uh, the municipality of, of Yarmouth, a very comprehensive policy that they're reviewing themselves and they're probably changing. But what what I found very interesting was the criteria that was included in, in that policy and it and I think it provides a starting point for for what we might uh, do presuming that this is something that you wish uh, to have happen um, so I added that information as business arising for your review um, I, not not to I guess I, my intention was not to to bring it to your review to to discuss like the pros and cons of criteria here or there it was it was it was simply to address the notice of motion to say okay let's or actually it was a motion to to bring that information to your um to your attention uh, i did uh others don't have policy but they have practices that mimic um what the municipality of yarmouth has here in terms of criteria very close to that um since that time i also had the opportunity to speak with um uh, state in use who was referred to me by Don Houston from uh, Transportation to talk about how traditional sidewalks are done uh, in rural uh, areas, and he mentioned uh, he mentioned two things. So, so one is the the typical urban design, which is the one you'll see in in most of like the Hebrons and the, and definitely in the town, um, with exception of some walking trails in the town. Most of them are urban design meaning you know it's an extension of the existing road onto a curb and then you have your sidewalk um, so recently in Dayton I believe they extended a sidewalk in that area um, that brings um, was very strategically decided to do that it extended the sidewalk into a trail uh, which is um, I can't recall the road but it's the road that brings you to the rec center in Hebron there's a you take the main high, highway one or whatever Evangeline Trail and you you take that road so so the extension brings you up Evangeline Trail to the municipal building but also up that road so there's a destination in both locations that is an urban design and they are uh, they are as as we discussed uh, at the last meeting about a thousand dollars a square of a foot so so a kilometer would cost you a million bucks to do it that way that. So that is confirmation of information we probably already knew. There is another version of sidewalks that exists and it's called the, the rural design. Um, and then there's also a hybrid. So I'll go into a hybrid quickly. A lot of, so a hybrid in my mind um, uh, would look, well, no, it, it could look like the Tusket one. Um, a hybrid is basically infilling the ditch doing and doing the um, uh, all of the water management piping and everything in the ditch uh, and then then putting a sidewalk on the top it it often does not include the curb so that that would be your your only difference from the traditional urban that might be a little bit cheaper but it's still in the eight nine hundred dollars a square foot and then you have the rural design which is by far the least expensive tra traditional sidewalk design and i and so what that is essentially is it is it is done uh with right of ways from property owners so it skips the ditch all together uh and and puts the sidewalk on the opposite side of the ditch rather than on the ditch and in filling with with uh, piping etc so 
you're not using DOT's property, you're asking permission to use private property for right of way. Now that can present some challenges depending on your community. Um, some people are right on the road, so you can imagine what that might look like. Uh, nice little path in front of your porch, you're there with a coffee, somebody walks by, it's like, oh, look at that, good morning. So there, there, there are some challenges associated with that. And, and uh, you can, uh, if you wished as council, if you wanted to see one um, in the Rockville area, Kelly's Cove area, there's a three kilometer um, uh, sidewalk that costs a little bit less than what a kilometer would um, under traditional uh, urban design. And that was done by the municipality of Yarmouth. Now that one is not concrete or asphalt, it is uh, dirt, which of course is fine for walking if you're an able walker, but you're, you have problems if you have accessibility or you know, wheelchair or any other issues, you, 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 haven't, you haven't answered that question. So they did that as, at, at a very low cost and they got a, a, very, you know, a very excellent project out of it. But, but of course it's not an urban design, it's not concrete, it's, it's and et cetera. So, so there are ways to do sidewalks cheaper than $1,000 a square foot. Uh, so that was one of the points I wanted to make. And the other point is Municipality of Yarmouth has really a lot of good experience, recent experience doing sidewalks in their own community. So they have invaluable information from their public works department that could be helpful for you if this is something you want to uh, dive into. Uh, we do have obviously engineers and engineering firms that uh, that are that are well versed in this as well. I have, <clears throat> excuse me, I have asked staff or a staff person in particular to start looking at alternative uh, uh, material for sidewalk uh, construction. Uh, you know, the traditional is asphalt, concrete, gravel, but you know, what about recycled plastic? What about like, is there is, are there other things that we should be considering uh, in light of it being 2021 and uh, understanding that there are perhaps some more innovative ways to approach this issue uh, with materials that may in fact attract funding from FCM and other um, uh, funding models that, that support this kind of innovation around renewables. So that is what we have learned since the last meeting. And if any questions or comments, I'm All right. Sorry. Um, I could just have a question about the, the dirt sidewalk CAO Muse, and, and you may not even have the answer to this, but I guess it's something that I'm thinking about. Um, so dirt sidewalks, do we know anything about wear and tear? How do they hold up? Do they last a long time? Like, is it worth the investment? Those are all questions that I'm thinking about? I don't have solid like CPA numbers to support what I'm about to say. Um, I can tell you that uh, the maintenance is higher uh, with, you know, a non-concrete, non-asphalt solution. You're, you know, when you're plowing, you're taking snow off, you're taking more than snow. So it's, it's the same, it's the same argument as gravel roads versus paved or chip seal roads. Like, you know, the useful life is not as high and the maintenance is certainly higher. That's a, a very strong consideration in our, in, in our um, uh, office, in our shop, because we have limited resources in order to, to maintain. So if it takes a lot more maintenance, that's, you know, it's not, we're not just building sidewalks, we're building staff to support sidewalks being built. Uh, so that is definitely uh, something to consider. Hans, did you have something to, you had your hand up, did you have something to to answer that question or? Yes, I had, uh, I mean, as an experienced landscape architect, uh, de designing trails, walking trails with all various of uh, surface materials, uh, just meant to, yeah, provide my comments to that question from Council Albright, that a gravel trail or a crusher dust trail is definitely more, uh, uh, needs more maintenance. Uh, the dirt is just being washed out by rain very, very frequently. Uh, you have to refill these holes quite often, and yeah, the plowing with the maintenance and etc. And it's just the walkability or usability is not as uh, flexible as other materials. So definitely has big drawbacks. 
even though it's cheaper to build. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other question? Um, Councillor Sonia? Can find the body. Um, is there a criteria or what are the main, I guess, reasons for the warrant of a sidewalk? Is, is, is that listed in there? It, it is as part of the yes, I think is the uh, is the quick answer. Um, I the way that municipality of Yarmouth identifies the need or, or seeks to identify is is it, it looks like it looks at uh, the type of road, it looks at uh, traffic volume, uh, pedestrian density, and 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 uh, obviously the cost safety issues, past fatalities, past, uh, you know, accidents that have, uh, you know, caused concern. So in the capital construction, there are scoring factors, there are four of them. And uh, I don't know exactly how they, um, I, I, I'd have to look at, at it closer to give you a specific answer, but they do have a very detailed technical evaluation process associated with it. And a lot of it has to do with traffic volume, um, which which to me would be a logical uh, criteria. It is not the only one, obviously, um, but they do have a scoring system here that I'm not familiar with, um, but they do have it here for them. Is that it? Uh Councillor Sonia, any more? Uh, no, I, I read that too, well, uh, I, I read it kind of fast and unlike you, it's a little bit confusing, but I know they have, they have scoring points. And, and I look at uh, the traffic volume as definitely one of them. And of course, uh, you know, that Plymouth's been looking for sidewalks for a while. And the school is also, I'm sure, an issue because it's uh, kids in public place and access to the school. I also might add that, that, that uh, just for the record, that Plymouth is the only school with passing lanes on either side of the school. Uh, there's two, two stretch, stretches of road quite straight and there's cars coming in quite fast to a sudden uh, speed zone. So um, I'm guessing that that would be part of a, somewhat part of a criteria. But anyhow, it's, um, I'd like to find out what all the criteria are. I guess that's it for me for now. That's right. I, I, sorry, I would also just note that very uh, that that what you see there is in draft mode. So they are making changes. You know, I took the chance to put up a, a draft policy on your on your council agenda that belonged to somebody else. But I think the point is, you know, I don't, I don't, I think we can, you know, we obviously ignore some of the things that are in progress here. But I think the point is, is is they've done a really good job. At establishing a set of criteria that that we could certainly use as a foundation for our own. Uh, just a point I'd like to make, and it's the same old story that I've heard for twelve years. If you don't live in Wakeport, Pumnico, or Tuskegee, you don't get nothing, you know. And uh, that's a sad part when I look at this, at this this proposal and. It's the same thing. The smaller you are, the less you get. That's all I have to say. Okay. Anybody else? Councillor Digden. Unmute, please. How's that? Yeah, that's a little better. <laughs> Good, thank you. Uh, yeah, when we were talking about sidewalks, I ended up... Uh, calling someone in another municipality that I know that they just put a stretch of sidewalk in here a couple of years ago. And again, you're looking at, they cost them around $2 million a kilometer. And I know when I put the, put the, um, a little blurb on my Facebook page about what went on at the meeting here uh, a little while ago, there was a lot of interest in sidewalks, but at the same time, 
I honestly, you know, I'd love to say we're going to have all have sidewalks before the night's over, but I don't know where in the municipality we'd get all this money. I honestly don't. Um, you know, and, and the alternative material, the only thing I'd be, and I don't know, I'm just, I guess, putting this out and maybe uh, Mr. Muse can answer me better on this one. I'm thinking about the accessibility guidelines that are going to be coming in and um, we could end up putting a lot of money out, but it could end up having a very short usable lifespan if it wouldn't be fully accessible for everyone. And, and I'd be concerned about that as well. Um, to, to your point, Councillor Digden, I, th I think it really and truly eliminates the idea of a dirt or I guess gravel style um, sidewalk for, for lack of a better way of describing it. I mean, we're not gonna pave our active transportation rails to trails. We know we're not gonna do that. That's right. But if we're gonna do a sidewalk in a community, regardless of the size or travel you know, density or, or to, to whomever's point uh, on where it should be done, um, we really have to have accessibility in, in the middle of it. Um, I, don't, I don't think you can do it any other way. And in fact, the Accessibility Act and the, the, the requirements of the province um, might, might restrict you from a legislative perspective to do it that way. I, I, don't, I can't answer that question accurately, but, but I can tell you that it will be a strong consideration if you're looking for third party funds and it's not accessible, you're probably on your own there. Yeah, one thing, right? And I and I personally would hope we'd never want to do it any other way this day and age. Um, I've actually seen people pushing wheelchairs up the sidewalk here in uh, West Pubnico, Middle West Pubnico, get these people out for outings and that. And and it's nice. It's nice that it's there for them. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Anybody else? Um, you mentioned, uh, uh, CAO, that the rural ones are built on private property. The, the department owns 33 feet, mm -hmm. and you can it can be built on highway property on the other side of the of, of the ditch as well. Like if you go beyond 33 feet, you're you're a long ways from you're you're really on people's front lawns and whatever. I, and I was wondering if that's the, the if that was correct or not. Well, my understanding is that you would require a form of right of way from the property owner. You could be right that a portion of the property would in fact be TIR property. Yeah. So the idea is that you're you're excluding the ditch. You're beyond the ditch. Exactly. So it's true that they might own past the ditch slightly, but most realistically is you're giving yourself some space from the ditch before yeah. you're even putting in the the, the sidewalk. So I suspect all, if not most of that would be private property. Yes, okay. They could easily say, yeah, right away, no problem. Or they could say, no, That's negative. That's and right. if it's a negative, then it's yeah. a negative. Um, so, so it's a, you know, it, it, it gets done. And, and some people who truly want that uh, infrastructure uh, are usually quite happy to allow that to happen, but they're usually not living right on the road. Exactly. They usually have quite a distance, so it's right. you can see them from far and not from the front porch. Yeah. Right? I know that the, the one that, that was built on, on uh, uh, well, I guess it's called Brooklyn, but it's uh, Pleasant Street past the, we started at the, uh, it started at the Meadowfield School Street, going, going towards the water, the water tank and half of them is curb and gutter, which is the traditional. And then they turned it on the other side of the ditch to continue. And yeah. that one there, I was involved in that one. And, and that one there was, was built, I would say probably 99% within the department property. There was a couple of properties where we, they, they had to make arrangements to fit, to, to, to buy or to, to uh, get the okay to do that. So anyway, I just wanted to, I, I just wasn't sure when you said it all had to go on the private property. 
and it and and it depends on where you're doing it, right? It depends exactly. on the situation, right? Yeah. Every situation would have to be analyzed that way. Yes, you're right. Yeah, uh, I see. Councillor Sonia had his hand up, and then Councillor Surrett, and I think once we get that, unless there's others, we'll uh, we'll close discussion on this. So go ahead, Councillor uh, Sonia. Uh, are we going to pursue? Uh, making our own guidelines or protocols for sidewalks so, or like I, I, I think there's room for discussion here in Plymouth for having a sidewalk put on private property. I, you know, they've been looking for it for quite a while. So I, 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 my question is, are we going to get our own policy? Are we, are we going to look into that? That, that was, uh, I presume the question is, is, is to me, uh, though, Though I believe the answer might be in council, so the intention, the intention of mine was to bring to you a, an example of a policy. Uh, the, so the question really that belongs to council to consider is, where do you want this to go? Understand that it's going to take some time, uh, not just to develop a policy because there'll be some back and forths, but also funding and all sorts of different. There's all sorts of different considerations. So it's it's kind of like the YMCA discussion. Like if you want to do it, that's that's one thing. But understand that if you, once you make that decision, there is a process that will will be in place that will take a while in order for us to do well. So um, it's it's a legitimate question, and I guess uh, it's a council answer. I just wanted to frame you know what I've given you, and I guess the next step is is up to you. When when do you want this work? If you want it to continue, and and if so, when when do you want? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I well, would... that to me. Okay. Go ahead. I, I just think it's up for debate, and I, and I think it's it's worth debating, and because I think the the sidewalk issue, like I've said before, has been been on our plates for a long, long time, and if it's not addressed now, especially the way we're talking about it, um, I think there'll there'll be repercussions. There'll always be questions, and so uh, I, I I think we should, uh, at the very least, uh, look into it a little further. Yeah, I, I further to what uh, CAO said, I, you know, I, I think, I think the first step is not to go and write a policy. I think the first step is to, to know, okay, are we ready? Are we ready to, to spend the money on sidewalks, you know, for the cost that, that, that uh, you'd have to know if there's funding, if there's whatever before we even do a policy. And I think the first step is to, to at least make a decision on, are we gonna be building sidewalks or are we not because of the cost and because of other uh, uh, reasons. So whether we can or we can't, so. Sure. Uh, okay, I had Councillor Surratt. Uh, I maybe tend to disagree with you, uh, Mr. Warden, and maybe, I'm, maybe I misunderstood you. Uh, I, I think, uh, uh, this council should have a policy on sidewalks, whether we're going to build them or not. I think that was my intention when I first brought this up. We should have a policy. It doesn't mean we're going to be building. Maybe we need a smaller policy. Maybe I can be corrected by our CAO on that. But I, I think, with, like Councillor Sonia said, I think we should pursue this and at least have a policy. But maybe I misunderstood CAO Muse. If it's going to cost us $50,000 for a study, for a policy, then therefore no, of course not. But if we can do our own small policy or whatever, certainly uh, I'm, I'm all game game for it. And uh, since uh, we're on the topic, yeah, Thank my you. view on doing a policy. Once you have a policy and somebody applies, if they fall within the policy, they're going to expect something. Where you know, and that's why I would say that 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 the first thing is to before we even do a policy is to know okay are we ready here that if we get if we get uh, uh, some uh, uh, a request to do this we have to be ready to 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 be able to do it especially if it falls within our policy and that's what i was saying it's best to know exactly where we're going with this and then if we know then we we can do a policy to say okay we're going with this but this is going to be the policy other than that we have a policy that that means nothing if we're not going to do it uh, okay, I have, okay, Councillor Albright. Thank you. So uh, I think to kind of answer Councillor Sonia's 
um, question or comment. We mentioned at the last meeting that we could bring it up when we have our priority setting sessions, right? And then we can determine whether or not it's something that we want to invest in and then whether or not it goes on our five-year capital plan. So it all kind of falls, it's like pieces of the puzzle, right? That we're all putting together that fall into place. So that was what we had kind of talked about last time. Do we put a policy first or do we do we decide whether or not we're going to invest in this? And, mm -hmm. and it's like I don't, chicken egg kind of thing. So I think, I think probably as Councillor Sonia said, this merits more discussion. And I think our priority session meetings would probably be the place that I would think that we would have conversations around this about. I agree. Uh, just that, the, and, and from an administrative perspective, I realize that's different than the political one is that I would, I would never want to have a conversation about sidewalks without, without the bigger picture painted, to your point, uh, Deputy Warden. Because uh, it's easy to say, we want sidewalks, but then it's like, we want Mariner Center, we want, we want, we want, and then so the list starts to build out. And so, so as a council, that's, that's your role, is to make the hard decision of, well, when are we going to get to sidewalks, right? And, um, you know, I, I, and in terms of policy, um, it, it's probably appropriate to, to have that priorities discussion first and I, then develop policy that you know will be supported by, by, the, elect, by the elected, right? Okay, no more questions from, from uh, councillors. Uh, Hans, you had something to add? Yes, uh, just as a as a little comments, uh, we're talking about a standards engineering item here. That's uh, it is defined as a standards way we think. Uh, maybe there's a solution. It is not standards. I mean, we're talking about unique. We have unique challenges. There are geographical uh, challenges, and there might be a different solution, uh, and we might have to approach it slightly different. So, just want to remind you that may there might be a different solution to this to this issue and to this well the request from the community to be more connected uh, might be otherwise as well so investing in sidewalks uh, should be uh, carefully dis uh, discussed in this uh, yeah okay. good okay if that is all we'll continue the next item strategic planning on the business arising and that is something that we have uh, we we have to do our uh, our five year strate strategic or or priority is is running out. So I think we have to sit down, and uh, I guess sooner rather than later we have to do that. So anyway, um, there's two items. There's one there, and there's one for decision on the same. Uh, on the, there's a proposal anyway. So um, if you want to take that uh, a CAO about what the plan is going to be here. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'll go a lot faster on this one. So I'm showing it under business arising from the minutes because at the last meeting I had made a commitment to meet a, meet a targeted deadline. So this is the first uh, meeting uh, that we're supposed to, to produce uh, information so that information is attached for for you to review okay. and to comment on not necessarily in this meeting because this is going to be an ongoing thing so i would i just for, it's really for the most part is for information though if you have questions or if you want to me to clarify anything in those attachments i'm, I'm happy to do that Co uh, the core group of staff is going to be uh, meeting next week uh, we're going to be setting a, a meeting time and space to talk about the two documents that I've that I've attached. The right. two are the community and corporate values. Um, so corporate values would be the values of the municipality, both, you know, how does council operate? What do they like? What, who, how are they? What, how do they interact as well as staff? And then there's the corp, the community values, which is what we observe from our community. So for instance, you know, volunteerism, you know, we have strong volunteers as an example of, of, of a community value, right? So all of those uh, didn't come from nothing. We did have that information uh, done initially with the strategic plan the first time we, we did it. And so these are revised and I guess updated from, from that time. Okay. Um, 
the corporate values, the municipal values were informed by a survey we did what feels like a year ago, because that's exactly when uh, we did it, uh, that that explains like, you know, how, you know, what does staff prefer in terms of doing work and being part of work, et cetera. So, and then you'll see a SWOT, which is the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Um, it is not a, the, the project is not to identify every single strength, weakness, opportunity, and threat. It is designed to allow the group to think about the things that we do that we have that are strong. So a strength might be, you know, strong, you know, strong fishing industry right now is a strength of our community. Uh, the, the, the threat, the, the, um, the weaknesses uh, might be, you know, weak rural internet, right? So uh, opportunities represent things that are happening outside of our organization that could present positive uh, opportunities for us. You may have received a presentation that would be an example of that, right? Renewable energy opportunities that you might be able to do in your community. And then threats represent outside factors that threaten uh, the future of your organization or the committee or the community, sorry. So an example might be climate change. I mean, that's like one obvious one. So, it, uh, so again, I've refined the list um, and staff will further refine it and we will bring that to a strategic planning conversation. So what we're trying to do is to do all these pieces that are required in advance of having a sit down workshop with staff and council facilitated by a company which is under 9H for your decision. Right. Uh, so, so, that's, so that's why it's in two different spots. One is to give you an update of where we are. Uh, at the next meeting, there'll be more. And we're hoping at the end of March to have a meeting with a facilitator. Anybody need clarification or questions? If not, uh, we'll leave it at that for information and uh, we'll go to the next, which is counselor's report. So I'm just gonna ask whoever wants to, to give the report to raise your hand. Counselor, Counselor Dantremo. And Councilor Albright and Councilor Surrey. Okay, um, I, I guess uh, at the start of the meeting, uh, I told you guys what I was going to talk about, so I'm just going to talk a little bit more about the uh, the situation uh, on the Rock Road. The Rock Road, for those of you who aren't familiar, is the same road where the uh, sewer tr treatment plant in West Palm Nico is. Uh, we've got a 4.5 million dollar building at the end of the uh, of that road. Uh, we have uh, we're probably 25 or so houses and for some reason every time we have snow uh the this the, the plow and i guess for lack of a better word the, the snow plow seems to forget where the rock road is or doesn't know where the rock road is uh it's happened <laughs> a couple of years ago it happened it, it seems to happen every year and i mean it's a recorded road it's paved uh there's no reason why uh and you know i'm frankly getting you know calls of uh, a lot of angry people uh Actually, uh, you know, I went there today, uh, this morning, it was, you know, the road was a mess. Uh, they finally showed up at, uh, I think, 12.04, is that 12.04? Yeah, 12.04 noon, uh, and and they uh, they plowed it, but it was too little too late. By then, all the, you know, everything was all frozen. And anyway, so uh, I would like to uh, either write a letter to TIR uh, to, you know, to put it on record that, you know, why has this happened, uh, you know, numerous times and, and, you know, all the other roads seem to be, uh, be plowed, for, but that one, for some reason, uh, not anyway, so that's, I don't know if I can make a motion right now, uh, to write a letter, uh, but anyway, that's what I'd like to do. You can, if you want to make a motion. So I'll make a motion that we uh, write a letter to TIR to ask them why uh, the snow removal is not uh, is, is not doing the uh, the rock road in Lower West Palm Nico. Okay, that's seconded from. Okay, that seconded by Councillor Donaldson. Any any questions? Any comments? Any? If not, if we're ready for the uh, ready for the question. Oh, okay. 
Councillor Digden, you had you had you had a hand up. Uh, the only thing I'd like to say is I can back up 100% what Calvin Dantema was saying. Um, I've been watching that road. Actually, that's why I know it was uh, plowed at 12.04 today because I was keeping an eye on it to see when the plow would come down there. Uh, I received numerous calls on it yesterday in emails and again this morning. So um, I back up Mr. Dantema 100% on what he's asking for there. Thank you. Okay. Councilor Woodrow. Yeah, there's not only the uh, the road in Pumnico. Uh, I think we should make a motion for pretty much all the rural secondary roads in in the, in the uh, district in in Argyle municipality of Argyle, because there, um, we've had roads here that were only plowed tonight at uh, or, or last night at eight o'clock. Yeah. But the motion, this one here, specific one road, that that motion, I would say. And, yeah, and it, it's one that keeps getting forgotten. Yeah, I, I, I understand. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, Councillor Dantamo, did you? Have yeah, it? and uh, you know, this is a for me, it's a specific uh, motion, and I'm not going to change it. How's that? Right. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. If we're ready for the question, all in favor, signify by raising your hand. Contrary-minded. Carrie, do you have anything else to report, uh, Councillor Dantamo? No, I think that was my hot uh, something they... item. Thank you. Okay, I have Councillor Albright. Yep. Okay, it's long, but I'll make it go as fast as I can. All right. So uh, to start off with, I'm going to talk about the splash park. So there's been a couple of meetings with the splash park. Um, they've made presentations to the town of Yarmouth, to the municipality of Yarmouth. They're going to be coming to us, making a, a revised presentation because they have more concrete numbers and they will be asking for a financial contribution, which the town and the municipality have agreed to um, as of right now. So that's coming, just heads up, wanted to give you a quick review on that. In terms of recreation, we've had recreation meetings. Um, Jeanette mentioned her signage project is up and running. I'm not sure if you guys know about that, but on the rails to trails from Pubnico Head to Tusket, there are some, there's signs along the trail to say how many kilometers from here to here to here distance wise so that's that was a pilot project that seems to be going really really well and that one is completed and they're putting some signage up at the east uh Pubnico bike trail as well um volunteer banquet is coming up it's going to be virtual again this year as it was last year and i believe that february 12th is the deadline for organizations to put in their submissions for their uh, their people um, Parc des Jeunes, just so that you know, so you're aware, the Parc des Jeunes in Wedgeport got a grant of $4,789 from the Community Health Board for upgrades to the playground in order to make it more accessible. So I just wanted to, you to, to know that. Um, also, we had uh, Councillor Sonia, myself, and Scott Surrett, and Jeanette, and Laura Lee Doucette, um, Laura Lee Green, Doucette Green. We have a subcommittee for the Glenwood Park um, project that we're working on. So there's four, four things that we're looking to have done. We're looking to possibly have beach volleyball, which is number one priority because we have a deadline for that. We already have approval for that. We're looking at expanding the swim area. We're looking at putting a boat launch for non-motorized boating. And we are looking at making a natural playground. But our first step for those last three is that we have to get permission from the Department of Natural Resources. So a letter is going forward. We're gonna do a site visit. We're gonna decide where things go. We can get from, uh, funding for a grant to plan that out for us so that we don't even have to worry about that. So that's, so especially for Councillor Donaldson, that's where that's heading. That's the direction it's going in. So work is, is going forward with that. Um, I've attended a meeting with Eelbrook Fire Department as well. They're, still looking for extra funding and it seems to be stalled at every every avenue it's it's been pretty frustrating but there's one final hope before they move forward and it's possibility of some covid funding but we're not sure how that's how that's going to move forward or not um let me see uh, the tri-unit meeting we had with ground search and rescue and uh, the white caps felt that that went very well um, it was the first tri-unit meeting we had had since we've had a new council and really good presentations and points came out of that. Had a Mariner Center expansion meeting. Um, it was a three hour long meeting where we had a lot of information about the expansion. 
and then two subcommittees were formed and I am on the new build subcommittee, which meets again this Friday, I think. Anyway, soon, there's lots of meetings. And today we met with uh, Deputy Minister Lefflesh for transportation, where we brought forward concerns. And for me specifically in my district, we talked about our gravel roads and we talked about the Rocco Point Road and the issues with the coastal flooding going on there. I think that's everything. Thank you. Sorry I took so long. <laughs> that's good. Thank you. Councillor Surratt. Uh, yes, uh, as, as Deputy Warren Albright said, we had a meeting with uh, um, the TIR, Department of Transportation, and uh, certainly the Tittle Road was brought up as a concern for flooding uh, once a month, at least once a month. We have water over there and stalls people, even, even service people, people who go to the end of the wharves. And that's so that was brought up and they're, they are actively looking for funding to do a bunch of these roads. I wish I had known about uh, Councillor Dartmouth's uh, issue with the Rock Road. That would have been a great uh, item to bring up while the deputy uh, minister was there along with his, his entourage. Would have been a great thing. But anyhow, the letter's going out. Also, I had a meeting with the, uh, the uh, airport. Uh, that was a great meeting. We've got some things moving there, hopefully. We'll get with Celtic, hopefully Celtic will be... Uh, Celtic Air Services out of Port Horsbury will be looking at uh, some kind of a, uh, oh, well, how will I say that? Some kind of a, uh, maybe a service proposal. And yeah, we're looking at that. That should be coming, I would think, in the next couple of months. Our deadline there for our airport, uh, for our uh, funding for Abuse Body of Argyle is March the 31st. So I'm sure they're looking to get that done. Uh, also, like Councillor uh, like Albright said, uh, the meeting with uh, the units on the Y, y cap, the opening of the, uh, uh, the aquatic center again at the, the old YMCA, Ground Search and Rescue, and the Mariner's uh, Center Workshop. That's it. Thank you. Anybody else? Councillor Councillor Bork and then Councillor Donaldson. Thank you, Warden. Um, this past month or so, I've been, I attended the uh, Yarmouth Area Industrial Commission. And also, uh, I'm on a volunteer for the uh, Café Conseil Acadien Parabas, just to inform you that there is a breakfast in the morning from 7.30 to 9.30. Uh, Five dollars a takeout. So um, this year was because they had funding available um, that they never spent. So they're giving um, each community center or whoever in the communities uh, opportunity to make some money. So it's a good way for them to fundraise. So it's on February the 16th uh, from 7.30 to 9.30 in the morning. I think uh, you probably had some flyers in the mail about it. Mm -hmm. uh, attended the Nikhil meeting. I attended the... Um, uh, the recreation uh, meeting as well as with Nicole Albright. I attended a finance management session and it was a, a three mornings. Uh, that was the last week of January and I really enjoyed it. It was uh, very interesting, um, a good refresher of what to look for in the finances and things like that. So that was very important. I'm glad I attended that. Uh, so I attended also the uh, special council meeting for the Y. Uh, the regional council meeting presentation for ground search and rescue and the white caps. And also I attended the TIR meeting with uh, Deputy Minister uh, Paul Laflesh. And I did uh, mention about our roads, um, the side roads and things like that, that we have uh, issues about all the time. And I did mention uh, why um, about the uh, intersection 32. Thank you. Councillor Donaldson. Can you unmute? We can hear you better if you're unmuted. Is that better? Can you hear me now? I don't <laughs> think too long. Uh, uh, Nicole Albright mentioned number of meetings that we attended. So I'll go on about that. And, and uh, what I would like to say is uh, the coverage map is out for rural internet. And I'm pleased to say that from what I can see, the majority, if not all of my district is covered. But in the 
Meantime, Bell has come out with a service of wireless internet, high speed, relatively high speed, but a lot better than what most of us has got. And it's changing all the time on who can get it, but it seems to be covering a large part of my district and there has been people signed up and are very pleased with it. Their only concern is as more people sign up, it may slow down, but that's yet to be determined. But it is an option that people, some people have until fiber off is in place. So it was it's good. That seems to be the main topic for me in my district now is the high speed issue. I get a lot of calls, a lot of emails, texts, whatever. And uh, so I'm glad to see this moving forward and I'll be so glad when we start seeing trucks laying wire. Thank you. Thank you. The, 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 the phrase or the, the comments mostly used, the most used in 2020 was please unmute. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Councillor. <laughs> and not just you, uh, uh, Councillor Donaldson. <laughs> uh, Councillor Dickin, I think I saw your hand. Did you have? Yeah. Uh -huh, there you go. You're not going to get me this time. I got it <laughs> unmuted. Okay. Um, attended a Remo meeting. Uh, had a meeting with the West Public Fire Protection, and also sat in on the Mariner Center expansion meeting. And also, um, I didn't know about it, but I would have liked to have sat in on the airport meeting. Now, again, I believe we're allowed to sit in on these meetings as guests, uh, being as though we are counselors. But I guess if we're if the invitation never gets out to us, we don't know when to sit in on them. So I'm just wondering if those invitations could be put out when these meetings are, are going to be happening. Uh, biggest reason I like sitting in on them is we as a municipality put in hundreds of thousands of dollars to those places. And if I'm asked questions by the residents, I'd like to be able to give them some insight as to what's going on. So I'm just wondering there if we could get invitations to those meetings. Um, it's like Mayor Mood said here, uh, it's not the FBI meetings or nothing like that. So everybody should be able to, to listen to them that wants it as council members. So I just like that noted. And also, I guess when it's uh, talking about motions and that, I'd like to make a motion that the municipality of Argyle write emergency health services and ask them why the base, the paramedic base in Pubnico is on staff a lot of the times, or when it is staffed, that the base is only more of a place for the oncoming crew to check their ambulance over and head out and the offgoing crew to head home. Because there's days where you can go there by there day and night and there's no ambulance in that bay, no paramedics around. I've been getting reports of 25 minutes, half an hour, over one hour to get an ambulance down here in this area. Um, they can say about beating a dead horse. I intend to keep beating this until I get some answers from somebody. And that at least at the end of the day, when something does happen, happen, and that I can say I tried and I tried my best. So I'd like to put that in the form of a motion. If I get in it back or that's all right. If I don't, that's still all right. And that, that's my report. So that's a motion. We yes, need, it is. We need a seconder. Seconded by Councillor Bork. So any, yeah, uh, go ahead, Councillor Strath. Uh, Councillor Dickton, or maybe not Councillor Dickton, this should go maybe to the CAO. Uh, before we write a letter, shouldn't we have numbers, like uh, actual proof? If we go by, well, Councillor, and no Councillor Dickton, you know what you're talking about. I'm not trying to, to put you down that you don't know, but... If you send a letter, wouldn't you have, when you need some specific numbers or something from them that shows, that shows what the numbers are? Because if we send a letter because this guy said or that guy says, uh, do we have enough proof? I, I don't know if the CAO could answer that or that's it. Well, um, I think uh, Councillor Digden goes down in the record books for what has to be the longest motion uh, 
uh, ever stated uh, on our on our council, uh, and I think and I, I mean that I, I'm just trying to not I'm not trying to diminish the seriousness of the issue. The uh, I think the motion says that that we're we're asking for an explanation for the absence of people at the EHS or whatever. So, you know, um, if if we were asking them to provide the data, they would have that data. They should anyway. But I think I think if we're if we're simply asking them to share that data again, because we have asked them to do that before, but but you know, and I um, I don't want to speak for Councillor Digden's motion, but I think the motion doesn't require us to have the proof. It actually puts the burden on them to provide us the information. If I understood the motion correctly, I would say, yeah. I'm asking for an explanation and I'm asking for an improvement. It's as simple as that. And they're supposed to have all these numbers they told us at their fingertips. Although when we met with two of them, they didn't have no numbers at their fingertips. So hopefully in four years time, their fingertips will have got a little more sensitive and they'll be able to find these numbers for us here now. Uh, the people waiting for these ambulances and these paramedics at two and three and four o'clock in the morning or two and three and four o'clock in the afternoon and that they know the numbers, they know what's going on in rural Nova Scotia, and it's not only going on here, as our MLA will tell us. So I'm just seeing what they're what they're going to tell the people of, of the municipality of Argyle this time. So, oh, Councillor Butchow, you want to speak on the motion? No, and Councillor Sonia, no. Okay, so we'll vote on the motion. I'll call for the question. All in favor signify by raising your hand. Contrary minded, carried. Okay, so back to councillor's reports. We have Councillor Boudreau and Councillor Sonia. Councillor Boudreau, you're on. Uh, I'm on mute, please. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to get into uh, details, but I, I got a few things on the go. Uh, brush cutting at intersections. Uh, I took it upon myself to, um, by the request of uh, the former uh, the, the councillors, uh, if you want them cut, you got to cut them yourself. So that's what I did. Uh, I'm working with Hans, uh, trying to get some application filled out there for the uh, Wedgeport uh, Water Waste uh, Project. And also, I've got my uh, first project that I completed. Uh, I got a complaint uh, from a couple of residents that uh, the school bus was using their driveway as uh, to turn around, which was no problem. But the uh, school bus was uh, causing potholes in their driveway. And uh, with the help of Adam Muse, uh, we got some gravel. Uh, they compacted the gravel, done a real good job. And the residents are really happy, and I'm happy. Thanks. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Sonia. Yeah, in my quest or in Clement's quest for sidewalks, I requested from Alain and Lori some information on past requests. And I got some, some interesting uh, feedback, I guess you want to call it. And in the process, I also got the 19, uh, 2016 uh, active transportation plan and I got some info in here that I have to share with council. In, in this 216 active transportation plan, there is uh, six schools, including Plymouth. And below the picture of the Plymouth school, there's a 30 word footnote and I read through this active plan at least four times, maybe five. And each time getting a little deeper and deeper. And active, the active transportation plan did a lot of good work and a lot of great recommendations. The problem is the only place the deployment school is mentioned is in that footnote. Um, Natalie. Surat Dothermo uh, wrote a piece on it and I quote, she 
she put Upland Consultants were in our municipality for a week to do research and to have an opportunity to hear from communities. Three open houses were held and four school engagement. Unfortunately, the Plymouth School was not consulted during these community engagement sessions. In her closing statement, she, I quote again, she says, in conclusion, Argyle Active Transportation Plan supports the opportunity to increase active transportation around our schools. Unfortunately, the school community of Plymouth was not consulted and their views were not captured in this plan. So it leaves us, it left me feeling cheated. And in the end, I said, I don't feel cheated, I am cheated as a community. And so does the community members. In light of asking for sidewalks for all these years, and then you read this, you say, why was not the permit school part of this? I, I, I don't understand. I know it's got nothing to do with council, but I don't understand why that the, the one school that has the heaviest traffic is excluded. Totally, 100%. And Natalie, closing statement is very telling to me. She, she's seen this, she, she, she saw that, she picked it out. Anyhow, it's, it's not a question, it's a statement, but, but I'd like to know why, uh, I guess in the end, why Plymouth was not including this. I don't know who can answer that. Um. I'm not sure. This is uh, something that was done by by uh, an outside firm, so I guess they would ha they might have the answer of why it was it was neglected. I I really can't answer that myself, unless our CAO has an answer on that. But it's a very difficult to answer that since the municipality did not do the survey themselves, like the the, the actual plan. So. I, I and I don't have a strong explanation for the exclusion of of that school or it's it the, the needs of Plymouth in that consultation document. What I can say is that our recreation department was engaged in the discussions uh, as it was you know really led uh, on behalf of you, the rec department really pushed for, and 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 definitely for good reason, uh, an active transportation plan. I also know that when we did this work and and we did it collaboratively, uh, we went out to the community to seek input, um, and so i can specifically speak to natalie's comments on the active living uh active transportation document because i specifically tasked natalie to take a look at the active transportation study in lieu or in light of a recent presentation by community members of the of the community of plymouth uh had done a presentation to council saying look you know like you know to talk about the the importance and need of a sidewalk in the area and all the reasons that were presented. So subsequent to that, I, I had asked Natalie to compare the active transportation document or and, and take a look at what would be, what is there in Plymouth that would fall into this plan. And to Councillor Sonia's point, um, she noted that there was very little uh, that spoke to the, uh, the need for Plymouth, though there is, uh, shall I say, uh, evidence collected by the consultant that suggested a traffic density that was quite high in that area. So I could certainly, on behalf of you and council, ask the consultants why they didn't include anything uh, on the Plymouth uh, side of things 
because there are, are other pieces of information in that document that suggests that they should have. Um, so I can't answer that for them. I can speak to the process and the process included uh, public engagement. And if, for instance, for whatever reason, the community of Plymouth was either underrepresented or not engaged directly by the firm, that might explain uh, the absence of that in the report. Um, based on, and you've asked this question of me uh, before, Councillor Sonier, and I, and I thank you for that, for allowing me to investigate at least initially uh, why that might be the case. Again, I don't have a solid answer. I, I'm, I can assure you that I will investigate that on your behalves, if that is the will of this group, uh, to, to take a look at why, why it wasn't there. The only other, the last point I would make on this is that I know that their focus was on the blue transportation route, which was for cycling and had, their intention was to connect communities across the province and I'm quite sure that the community of Plymouth would not have been in, that would not have been part of that blue route. I know the blue route came through East Pubnico, and I know that that's why East Pubnico is specifically mentioned um, as well. So I hope that's helpful information. It doesn't erase your point, and I think your point has validity that should be further investigated. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, all I'm, all I want to say in light. Of, of, of asking for, for sidewalks and, and trying to put an importance to it. When we, we have kids in that school and that school proximity to the road is the closest school in all of Argyle. It's only 42 meters from the, from the road. We have, we have the ball fields, we have the tennis courts, we have the playgrounds. There's no accessibility to this. And you know, so they talk about the active transportation getting to and from schools. And by not being part of that act of transportation, uh, Plymouth is lacking any recommendations that could strengthen our argument for sidewalks or safety in our community. That, that's my point. That's why I bring this up. Is, is that it? Do you have anything else? Uh, no, that's, that's it. That's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, everybody. Um, next one is the uh, uh, warden's report. It's attached. Uh, I just listed the meetings in the, the uh, what I attended since the last meeting, and uh, I'm not going to go into it. Uh, some of the meetings and a lot of the meetings were attended by other people as well, and they they discussed like the the financial. Uh, uh, session that we had for three three half days. Uh, I attended that, and I think it was very very. There's some very good information on that. I I think anyway. Anyway, that's all I have on that. Uh, staff report. That goes to staff, which is a CAO. Uh, the report is submitted. Um... In the interest of time, I'll ask if there are any questions. Anybody have any questions on the report? Councillor Bork. Just a question uh, that I get from a lot of people is, when is our new school building going to be ready to move in? <laughs> right, I hear that question a couple of times an hour. Uh, I hear it every day. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. So we're a we're still on schedule. The substantial completion from Garyan uh, construction is uh, the month of May, late May. So you know, give that a couple of weeks. Give give some coordination around moving. We think we're being moving. We think we will move in in June. Um, it could be late June. I I still expect the move to be in the month of June. Um, as an update on the actual uh, construction, they are finishing crack filling they're you know like they they're like give us give us the colors you know give us the colors for the interior uh so you know so they're really moving you know forward in a pretty aggressive way we we did have an uh, an audio visual uh meeting today to to confirm what 
technology is going to go in the council chambers and like little things like that. There's a lot of those little things that are happening all the time. Um, so yeah, the long answer is June. Uh, the solar is coming soon. I don't know exactly what date, but those panels are coming. And just an, a fun fact, that's what my sister would say, and they're almost never fun when she says it, but uh, fun fact is as soon as the solar panels get installed, they produce energy. So uh, even if they're not connected to the grid. So, the, you know, the question is, is like, how quickly can we put it on the grid? And in the meantime, we have to ground them because they start powering up like a transformer, you know, not, not, a, not a transformer, like anyway, uh, like the kids show transformers anyway. So, uh, so it, it was quite an interesting fact that they, these things, they just, they just start working. I'm like, okay. So. I have a question on that. Oh, was that a hit? I'm sorry. Uh, yes. I have a question on that as well on the solar panels. I was asked that question. If the power we're feeding it into the uh, grid, correct. So, if that area loses power, do we lose power? Yes. That's what I. Are we going to have a generator back up like we had at the other place? No. Okay. So, how it will work is. Uh, uh, we, we've gone through this, uh, I'll try to keep this brief because it is technical and I'm not an electrician, but we did have the, the discussion. And so our options were that we could charge batteries. Yes. The solar could continue to generate energy and, those, and that energy could, in theory, charge batteries. So if we lost power, the battery power would kick in. The problem is, is it costs an exorbitant amount of money to do that. And so for the small amount of times that we might not have power, uh, we might, you know, we might be in a situation where, uh, you know, we may have to find kind of a, 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 another way to deal with like server related issues, but most people can work from home now. And so, uh, so there's, there's that. The other issue of course is generators are diesel fueled machines. So, that kind of flies in the face of our net zero energy concept and would have resulted in potentially resulted in a negative scoring uh for for government funding so you know do you do you do you put it in and and uh do you put it in well yeah there are benefits certainly in putting in a generator um our experience is we don't use it that much and because we can do things from home now um it it seemed more practical to actually not solve that problem, if that makes sense. Any other questions? Like a hundred grand, like they're like seventy to a hundred grand for the wow. batteries. Uh, Councillor Dantrimal. Uh, this is a question for Hans. I guess since he's still here, um, I was just looking at your report and the 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 uh, dewatering solution that we. have we're coming up with with for the uh, West Public Hill sewer. I guess uh, I've been talking about the the Rock Road and the the, the sewer road all night, so I might as well keep the, the topic. Uh, they've surely endured enough between you know not having timely uh, plowing in the winter to uh, to a smell in the summer. So when are we uh, hoping that uh, Trident comes up with, uh, with the the system uh, so we can put it in place? Sure, no, I'm happy to answer that. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. And uh, the order is placed. Uh, the machine is being manufactured currently, and uh, the schedule is slightly delayed with what's on doing by uh, separating the auger that is needed to transport the dried out material from the machine into our uh, uh, carriage or, like, let's say, uh, the trailer or the, the vehicle we're using to transport it off sites within the same day. Uh, so we added that on a few weeks later. So that's under production now as well. So that delayed it by a few weeks, but we're still looking at early April to uh, install the machine and have to start up within the first few weeks of April. Great, thank you. No problem. Anybody else? Seeing none. We'll move on, item nine for decision. 9A is bylaw 39, civic address and signage, second reading. And I guess uh, there were some 
we already had the first reading and at this point we're we're okay to uh, to vote on this to pass it so any questions anything on there I would ask our municipal clerk if there were any comments uh, received from the public no I didn't receive any comments okay so it's been published and everything so yes yes okay so if there's no questions we need we need a motion to accept moved by councillor donaldson seconded by councillor albright no, albright and if there's no further question i'll go i'll ask for the question uh, all in favor signify by raising your hand contrary minded carried code of conduct for staff this is also this is also the second reading this is also ready for uh, for a motion any any comments or or questions uh, modifications Gail? since Sorry, there were modifications since the last. It, it includes language around the policy applying to CAO. Um, I do have a solution in the future for other policies relating to CAO versus staff versus CAO. So I'm going to have a, a solution in the future for that. Uh, but it seemed reasonable to include it here in the way that we've done it. And we also made some minor wording changes that came from the solicitor, none that merited uh, a, a political, like putting the yellow for political yes. purposes was right. mostly just cleaning up language. So, so moved. Moved by Councilor Surratt, seconder. Seconded by Council Bork. All in favor signify by raising your hand. Contrary minded. Carried. Emergency funding policy. That's ready for, for as well. And uh, I just see one thing in yellow here. And that's to, uh, it has to do with uh, 3.3, 3, 3.5, and that is uh, where councillor can can also provide in writing the nature of the emergency and whatever. So this one is ready for a motion as well. So move. Moved by councillor Digden, seconded by councillor Dottermont. And any questions or comments on it? Seeing none, all in favor, signify raising your hand. Contrary minded, nay, carried. Wastewater project. And what this is, is uh, if you've read it, it's a con concerns by, uh, uh, concerned by some of the residents that, that are from the Wetchport. This is the Wetchport one, by the way. And uh, they, they're wondering why this can't go back to the property owners rather than being owned the whole time by the municipality and charging a, a service, uh, a yearly service. Now, I don't know that we, I don't think we can make motion on this tonight. I think it's something that we have to discuss a lot more. And, and find out more information about what that would entail and, 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 and the, the pros and cons of doing that. But it's something that I think should we should discuss, I do believe. I mean, when you look at it, I guess it makes sense, but there might be some, some uh, ways that, that uh, there might be something that kind of puts us uh, in a, in a position where maybe we can't do that or, or, or there might be reasons why we feel that it has to stay in the hands of the municipality, but it's something definitely that we would have to discuss for sure prior. We, I don't think we can make a motion on this and say, yes, it can, it can revert to, to the property owner without having more detail on, on, on what it would mean to have it. So if you've all read this, uh, we can, again, it's basically for information, it's more than just information, but it's something for us to think about and to plan a discussion on the matter. All agreed? Oh, just 
just lost my iPad. I can't go back here. What's going on? My my iPad won't won't go back. It keeps falling. Man. Drop it again. See, see how you make up the warden to mute. Out. Next time is going against the wall. <laughs> is that what you call a first world problem? Yeah. I can't even go back to my menu. <laughs> Done. Let me try again. There, I'm back. Uh, where was I? NSLC, home delivery. I guess there's uh, opposition to uh, uh, there's opposition to have NSLC deliver liquor to to residents, and I think what they're asking here is uh, basically is uh, they, they call them they, they want our support to call on the Nova Scotia government to act on this mandate and say not to have no home delivery. I guess they want our, basically us to support the, the request here that that uh, Nova Scotia, Powell, uh, Nova Scotia liquor uh, 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 change their mind on on having home delivery. Councillor Surratt. Uh, yes, uh, so the other councillors know uh, that's that's the uh, committee I'm on called the MAP Municipal Alcohol Project and it's kind of changed its name a little bit but uh, they, they sent that to each board member and I certainly didn't want to make a decision myself. They wanted me to sign it along with the others. And so before that went through, I asked our CAO and he said, I sent to him, he said, let's bring it up to council and see what they decide. So that's, you know, it'll be, uh, it'll be up to us if we do want to put our name to that. Okay, so any questions, any comments? So I guess what we need is a mo okay, uh, Councillor Sonia. Did you have something to, to any comments or okay, go ahead. I, yeah, I just want to say that I I agree with the letter. I don't think there should be any home delivery. Exactly. It's so simple. I yeah. mean, they, they used to do it by taxi from the bootleggers years ago. You might still do it now. <laughs> yeah. So we need a motion. So Councillor uh, uh, Sret, I saw your hand was raised. I'd like to, I'd like to make a motion that uh, we uh, put our name on the uh, bottom of that letter, say we support the letter. Okay, a seconder. Seconded by Councillor Sonia. If there's no more discussion, all in favor signify by raising your hand. Contrary minded, carried. East Pubnico Water Tender. Uh, okay, so we had two submissions and the uh, based on the financial, the recommendation is uh, to Award to Gary and Construction. The recommendation is to negotiate, negotiate. with the qualified lowest bidder okay. being Gary and Construction. They were the low bidder, but, but Correct. okay, yes. So, Councillor Digden. Uh, thank you. Just wondering if we're negotiating with the lowest bidder, if the other bidder may come back and say, well, listen, I resharpened my pencil. We can do a lot better. Should we, I, I don't know, just don't want to see ourselves getting in trouble over anything or getting bad publicity. I'm just so that's not a, sure how it, it works. So that's a good question. Uh, so we're in contract A, and this, first of all, anything that you decide today will be supported by legal opinion. I will say that first and foremost. 
secondly, what I will say is that uh, when you have these um, bids that are over budget, um, you have the right to negotiate with the lowest bidder. Um, you you don't have to negotiate with both bidders. Uh, if you chose to negotiate with the highest bidder, you would have a problem um, because if you had a qualified bid that was more competitive, you'd have to have a darn good reason not, not to negotiate with the lowest bidder. So standard practice is to negotiate with the lowest bidder. I can assure council that um, this process uh, will be confirmed with legal support. Uh, in this instance, it is typical to negotiate when your budget is too high. Uh, there was another incident, uh, if you recall, where we had a situation where the lowest bidder was an unqualified bid. So we don't negotiate with unqualified bids. Um, and that can also cause some, some you know, questions to be asked for sure. I think in this case, uh, the, the, what, what, is, what ought to be a concern of council is, was it a competitive bidding process? And I think, you know, I think uh, our Hans has confirmed that the pricing was consistent with budgeting with maybe one large factor, and that was the housing component of the electrical that was, was not contemplated fully by us at the initial um, uh, budgeting, which is what Hans indicates in his report. So um, I, I can understand the concern that might be raised and I really appreciate the question because that's the kinds of questions you should be asking as a council is to make sure that that, that gets done appropriately. We believe that it is appropriate the way that we've recommended, but I will reiterate that legal review will occur prior to any decision. Okay, so, so if I may, chances are probably this will be awarded you're going to negotiate first. And if you can't negotiate, does that mean that we're not going to award it? And then we'd have to retender? So uh, how it will work is, and the recommendation will be to, to negotiate to bring the budget difference within a 15% of your total budget. That is a standard practice that occurs in construction when you have a 15% or more budget overage you really have the right to reject if you right. wish. Uh, we are choosing not to reject. What we are choosing to do is continue with the project, uh, having pretty solid information to support that we can do it cheaper if we just do it differently. So what we put out to, to bid was bid appropriately by both. And one was $50,000 less than the other. So the question is, so, so basically what we're doing is changing the parameters of that bid well, it's not going to change the fact that the higher bidder was $50,000 higher, right? So they'll both come down, but there'll still be a gap there that, that benefits or, or uh, supports the low bidder. Um, it, in that negotiation, if we can't get to 15%, I have to bring that back to council according to the recommendation I'm, I'm bringing to you. Oh, okay. um, what I'm suggesting is that there's a very good chance that we can bring it within reasonable budget parameters if we just change a little something. And then in the, if, that, if that happens, and it happens with, in the way that I've described, the recommended motion would allow me to, to, with legal support, award or approve the awarding of that project. So we cannot really award this to, tonight then at this meeting? We cannot award it as is. We have, so, so the recommendation would be to negotiate. Okay. Just a little uh, bitter with the intention of bringing it down okay to a reasonable budget overage okay because the the, the, the last uh, uh paragraph here number two says award the contract to gary construction which is what i was when i said that I, I i read that as if we're going to award it because it says award the contract to gary construction and move ahead with the needed upgrades on the system and fill the gap with, with other funds there's urgency regarding the acoba funding that should be considered so that's why I thought we were awarding when I read that. I'm sorry. Right. So I think you must be reading Hans's memo when you're yes. reading that. Yes. So what Hans has done in his memo is he's provided you with two options. Okay. One is to award as is and the other is to negotiate. So you're quite right. That oh, two uh, options. Yes. I'm so, sorry. Yeah. That's okay. And then on mine is basically saying of the two 
that Hans is recommending, this is the one I'm recommending to okay. you. Okay, oh, I had the wrong document out. It's no problem. Okay, so now we know what the motion should be. It's negotiate. It's to negotiate uh, uh, the lowest bidder to see if we can't if we can't go um, if we can't cut down his price uh, to come closer to our uh, uh, budget. Okay, yeah, I opened the wrong the wrong attachment. So, do we have a motion for that? Moved by Councillor Bork. Or do you have a question, Councillor? No, moved by Councillor Bork, seconded by Councillor Dachamo. If there's no questions or comments, all in favor, signify by raising your hand. Contrary minded, carried. The next one is the ground search and rescue. Now we've had the, uh, we've had the presentation we know their we know their needs, and we've said among ourselves, and we we brought that at the, you know that that we felt that they needed some funding. But I guess what we need is uh, a discussion here and a decision on how we're going to handle this and what we're going to do with this. So, Councillor Albright. Thank you. I feel like this decision is threefold three things we have to talk about. I think we have to talk about the funding for this year because we haven't given them anything this year. We were kind of holding off because we had money left over from our grants to organizations. So I think number one, we have to make a decision. What are we going to give them for this year or are we going to give them anything? Number two, we have to talk about sustainable funding for them year after year after year. How are we going to handle that? And the third thing I think we should talk about is their building. Are we going to help support um, fixing up their building, you know, is that is that going to be something that we would we would support if we were all in all three units? I think that's a conversation we need to have. But another piece of information that I got yesterday about that, um, in speaking with uh, with Sheldon Fitzgerald, who's in my community, who's a, a member with Ground Search and Rescue, is that there's a there's potential for them to maybe get a grant. They've been speaking with Colton LeBlanc. And there's potential to get a grant from Community Facilities Improvement Program. And uh, they have, they, there's a requirement for them to put in some funding as well in order to get this grant. But one thing they said, or two things they said would help um, would be a letter of support from municipality supporting their application and um, letting them know that we will be supporting them financially as well. He said that those two pieces would help it would potentially help their application go through. So those are the three things I think we, we need to talk about. What are we going to do for them this year? If anything, what are we going to do long term? And what are we going to do about their building? But that's a conversation we may hold off on. Okay. Uh, uh, Councillor Sonia. I agree with everything Nicole said, and with the funding for this year, my question is, uh, and I'll go back to what Mayor Mood said about the mold. I, I think she said she mentioned something about having the building inspected. So, for any reason, if that building is rejected, uh, and the funding we give them now, if they if they don't know the the building is rejected and they put the money into the building, it's a total waste of money. So um, it's, it's like the chicken and the egg again. Uh, what what do you do with money if you give it now? If they put it into the building, if they fix the roof for fifty thousand dollars, and find out that they have to abandon the building, so uh, I I think we have to first find out if the building if it's feasibly, economically feasible to fix that building and if it's cost efficient for the future. I think that's the first decision that has to be made. Uh, and, and if they want funding now, I, don't, I think the funding should not go on the building until we find out if they need the funding for other material, fine. So that's, that's my views. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Councillor Surratt. Uh, yes, I'd like to echo what uh, Councillor Sonia said. I totally agree with him on, on that part. Uh, Nicole, you made three great points. Uh, but myself too, 
I see that. Why is that building? What's, what's going to happen to that building? And uh, why go put money if, if it's, you know, if, if the building is really condemned? So uh, that's what I got out of that meeting when we were together. Uh, the three units that, uh, you know, let, let's, let's find that out first. And let's work on the other piece. That's it. Okay. Anybody else? Councillor Digden. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Sonia and Mr. Surrett and Ms. Albright uh, said the whole works pretty well. Um, as far as supporting them, I'm all in favor of supporting them uh, long term. And at the same time, I'd like to see the other um, municipality of Yarmouth and the town of Yarmouth support them uh, equally as well. Um, but at the same time, and we've brought it up before, as far as the building, uh, we don't know what kind of shape the building's in. And like Mr. Sonia said, it could be putting good money after bad. So, but as far as uh, giving them some money, I, I honestly feel as though if they need money right now for uh, equipment or whatever, uh, we should definitely look at that. We, we give them every year, I believe, and uh, we should definitely give them some. And they're well appreciated in the community. There's no saying they're not. It's it's like an ambulance service or the fire department. You don't think much about them until you need them, but then you need them. And we seem to have seen more of that in the last while here. You know, and, exactly. and, and makes you really opens your eyes to to the, the the work that these people do, and to think that that it's all volunteer. And volunteer. That's, you know. And 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 hardly any any support at all from the provincial government, and that really blows my mind, for for the type of service that it is. I mean, what they give them is is peanuts. So what's the wish here? What? Uh, okay, Councillor Albright. So I guess one of my questions, <clears throat> probably for CAO Muse, would be: Are we able to? Are we able to direct ground search and rescue to get a building inspection? Is that, are we, do, do you understand what I'm trying to say? Um, I understand what Councillor Sonia was saying about, you know, if their building is, 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 is not up to code or is, you know, if it's gonna be condemned or whatever, then not put money into it. But how do we go about that process? Like that's my, that's my first question, if I may. Well there's uh, thank you through you, Warden. So uh, how we deal with that is, in my estimation, uh, we either ask GSAR or do it ourselves with their permission, engage, and I'm going to say Delmar Construction, only because they've been dealing with Delmar Construction on the roof. So I'm not, I'm not, it, it's, it's up to them who they want to use and they've made a choice. So I know they have engineers on staff. Mark Bork is an engineer he could walk through that building and probably give us an idea of, you know, you know, yes, there are concerns. Yes, there's this and that and this and that, but structurally there are, you know, less concerns or more uh, depending on what he, he sees. So I think the first bit would be to either do it ourselves for them or ask them to do it. Um, on behalf of all three units. I suspect all three units will want to see that. Mm -hmm. And then we make a decision on that from from that from there. Right. So okay. so so that's an option. Now I they may already have that information. Okay. Um, you know, because if Delmar, for instance, is going in to price a, a roof, they likely took a look a, a, at a couple of other things as well. So they may have that information. Okay. Um, the so I think that would be a good step and you can make you can make a decision on funding conditional on a successful uh, inspection. Or you could just simply ask them to do that before you make a, a decision on capital. So that doesn't stop you from making a decision on operations. Right. But that was my other question. Oh, sorry. No, Pardon me. That's it. no I was just wondering if, if a building is condemned who makes that decision? It wouldn't be Delmar. It wouldn't be co uh, contractors. 
who who usually makes the decisions? That is that a municipal uh, uh, decision? Well, it depends on the nature of the condemnation. <laughs> uh, if it's a structural issue, um, none of the building inspectors can go in and without an engineer stamp and say, yeah, this thing is like, typically they would rely on an engineer to, to make a decision on structural. If there were fire related issues, that would be a fire inspector. If there were, uh, you know, environmental health issues, that would be another. So it really depends on the nature of the condemnation that we're, we're looking at. A good first step would be what what is the guts of it, right? Like what does the does the structure have a useful life? And the other things around, you know, health and safety and if there's mold and stuff, like those things can be remediated a lot of a lot of times. Like it's 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 often you just you know, you cut it out and you do a wash down, which they have expressed a willingness to to do partially on their own. Um, so, so I would start with structural because that's probably the bigger issue. Yeah. Okay. I so would defer to our structural building inspector. Right. Sorry, I would defer to our building inspector to give you a better answer than mine. I cut in there, uh, Councillor Albright. Sorry, go ahead. No, that's okay. I just, the other thing too is uh, we had. Was it $8,800 left over from our grants to organization CAO Muse? Is that the number that was? So we have to, well, we don't have to, but I think we should make a decision on what we're going to do this year in terms of operations. Are we going to make a grant to them? And then we still really need to talk about long-term. So can I make a motion? I'm gonna make a motion. I'm gonna move that we, um, we give ground search and rescue. Can I say $8,800? Is that what we had left over? Or should I put like whatever we have? Okay. Um, leftover funds from our grants to organizations in this, this year. I'll, I'll second that motion. Seconded by Councillor Dickton. Any, any comments or questions on the motion? Seeing none. As for the question, uh, all in favor signify by raising your hand. Contrary minded, carried. Okay, that takes care of that one for now. And then we can we can take it from the inspection or if we're gonna do that or whatever after. And even to see if they're gonna get a grant as well. So that's gonna yeah. make a difference on, on, on type of help that they might need from, from municipalities as well. Next one, strategic planning proposal. So, Ward yep. Muse, sorry. So we're not going to talk about the long-term oh, funding, like their feasibility funding? Are okay. we going to, is that something we should talk about now? We, we certainly can. Uh, I have, I see hands. Uh, Councillor Donaldson was first. Go ahead. Yeah, at the last meeting, the, the three CAOs were going to get together and talk about that, that that exact subject is especially uh, an alternate building. Is that taking place or are we, like Tony said earlier, the egg and the chicken? And... Yeah, the three CEOs haven't had the chance to talk about that yet, because that would have been last Wednesday. So that's, that's where that's at. So I think we got to wait do we get some information back from that meeting? I would suspect uh, unless somebody's got a better idea. Okay, Councillor Surrett, you had your hand up. Uh, Councillor Donson explained exactly what I'm gonna say. Okay. Yeah. So we kind of wait. Okay, Councillor Albright. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I know you want me to mute now, don't you, Richard? <laughs> um, last thing, they're looking for a letter of support for their grant application, as well as um, we need to let we need to let them know that we are we have given funding. Those two pieces will help strengthen their grant application. So I'd like to make a motion that we send a letter of support to uh, for ground search and rescue in their application. Um, and in that letter of support, we should mention that we have provided some municipal funding. Okay. I don't know if that's specific enough or not, CAO Muse, but I think 
we get just yeah. Probably yeah. should be. Okay, seconder, Councillor uh, Donaldson. Any more discussion on that one, Count uh, CAO Muse? Just that I will confirm the funding for this year. If, for instance, that they require specific information on the capital project, uh, I know the deadline for this is the end of February. This may come back to you before the end of February for a decision. By that time, we may have information on at least the structural integrity. You may be a little bit more comfortable with making such a commitment because it is a capital ask. So the, the 8,800 you just passed might do the trick, uh, but it might not. So just as a warning, we will absolutely do that letter, but we may need more before the end of the month. Okay. Is that it now? Can we move on? Okay. <laughs> uh, next one is the strategic planning. There's Point a- Point of order, we have to vote. We didn't vote on the motion. Oh, we didn't vote on the motion. Okay. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm getting old. I can for, I, I forget. Uh, all in favor, signify by raising your hand. Contraminded. Carried. Now, can I move forward? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, to, to speed things up here. I guess. Uh, strategic planning proposal. We've talked about the strategic, the process that we're going to go through for strategic planning. Uh, it's going to be, it's going to be uh, core staff, it's going to be us, it's going to be, we're going to go through the whole process, but there's a proposal here to hire a firm that would, uh, uh, they would go over proposals and uh, make uh, recommendations and whatever. So, so there's a cost to that, but it's, it's, it's not, it's not uh, uh, an experience extremely uh, uh, big cost because a lot of the work is being done and it's just for them to go over what what we've come up with so the I guess the proposal here is to see if we uh, to, to, to hire someone to, to this firm that would go that would go over what we our strategic plan so count uh, CAO Muse uh, you can you can take over and, and explain a little more Sure. Um, so first of all, for comparison of costs, we would have engaged Jack Novak about eight years ago. Some of you would have remembered. And the cost of that, I think, exceeded $8,000 eight years ago. Right. So, and that's not to offend the previous uh, facilitator. <laughs> Mr. Novak is a very distinguished person in this area. So I guess my point is, is that we've tailored it such that we're only using them for the amount of time that we need and, and not more. So the, 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 the key uh, result of this will be that they are going to describe, they are going to facilitate two half day sessions with council and staff. They will be doing the planning and preparation with myself and other key people in advance of that. We're looking at late March. I, I'm looking at the 25th tentatively, but um, you know, we're, we'll confirm that. And then they will transcribe the notes and do the, the finalizing of the report. So that doesn't mean they're going to finalize the entirety of the strategic plan. It means they're going to finalize that process and give us a report on that process. Mm -hmm. I think it's reasonable. I've had this, this happens to be the same firm that I've hired for team, team building exercise, which is, is uh, tentatively booked for early February to be confirmed. Um, so it's the same firm. They're using the same process. And I think there's use in having both processes be the same lead because team building and strategic planning work very closely together around, you know, executing a project that's, you know, for the betterment of community. And so I'm, I'm very pleased with, um, with the way they're going to do this. It's going to be very interactive and uh, it's really going to tease out what you guys want as council, I think. So I would be happy to recommend that we invest in this. Uh, this is not a budgeted item. Uh, so this will come out of the current year uh, surplus, or at least part of it will. So that would be my recommendation. And I, I'll answer any questions I can. Uh, take it easy, though. I didn't do the proposal. So uh, so um, I'll answer them as best I can. Any questions? 
Okay. So what we need now is a motion to approve this recommendation to hire this firm. Moved by Councillor Donaldson. And seconded by Councillor Sonier. Again, I'll ask, do you have any questions on the motion? Seeing none, I'll call to the question. All in favor, signify by raising your hand. Contrary minded, carried. Correspondence, municipal affairs and housing is number one. And I guess it's just a letter to verify something that we already knew. We knew we were getting that money or we already got it. Is that correct, uh, Council, uh, CAO? It speaks to the accountability that they're gonna set up, which yes. Basically, there's broad categories, and we're going to do our best to put every little thing in those categories so that we can show that we're using their money and not ours. Uh, the other piece that you should know is that the funds that we won't spend this year can be put in reserve for next year. The next one is uh, TNR and uh, TNR. There, my computer just locked there. I can't get out of this file. That's weird. Okay, well, I received the letter and I guess that was something that, that Councillor uh, uh, Dodgemall had, had brought up before. And it has to do with, uh, uh, with the, the project, uh, Friends of uh, uh, Trap, Neuter, Release. And from what I read here, I think they're, they're just explaining how important and, and the cost, you know, and probably they'll be looking for for uh, for financial support as well. And I think I think uh, um, they would like to have a, a um, I would say they would like to have a presentation at some point just to, to explain what they do and whatever. So basically, that's what that that was. And now I can't get back to my menu, to my. I can't see, I can't see my agenda anymore. What was the last one? There was only one more. Jump in, Nicole. YMCA right. letters. <laughs> YMCA, yeah, YMCA letters. <laughs> you need a new iPad. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I'm trying to tell uh, Scott that. <laughs> it's, it is new. <laughs> it's at least three months old. <laughs> I don't know why it does that. Anyway, so these are a bunch of letters. Uh, I know we all received a whole bunch of them. Um, um, uh, Lori had asked if anybody had some to put on there. I could have given her probably 25, but... Uh, I, I only stayed with the ones that were really addressed to me or that I felt came from, from our municipality. A lot of the letters that came were from uh, different municipalities, but the concern is definitely there and it's there for everybody. So, okay, if there's no questions on that and I don't know how I'm gonna get back to my agenda. No. Financial request. Financial request. Maybe why why don't you take over the meeting while I do this? Uh, uh, Are there any, there's no financial requests? Okay, we're gonna move Warden. on. <laughs> Agenda topics for next meeting. Notice of motion to get by counselors. Nope. Seeing none. Question period. Anything from from public? The questions were probably addressed during the presentation for the most part. And I do note that uh, our friend, um, uh, uh, Jason, Jeremy, Justin, oh my God. Jamie. Uh, Jamie. Uh, answer, Jamie. Jamie, and thank you. <laughs> I got there eventually, but it's late. Um, answered all of the questions Good. of the residents uh, that were technical. Oh, okay, okay. So the next thing, I'm in gonna camera. guess is adjournment. No, no in camera, so yeah. In is adjournment. There, is there yeah, there's no camera. 
no in camera. Okay. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> gee, gee, the, the... Uh, Scott, don't hang up. I'm going to show you this to, to see what. <laughs> oh, maybe I. Yeah, maybe I can show you what's happening here. <laughs> well, we need the motion to adjourn first. We need a motion to adjourn. Moved by Councillor Dotson.